You're listening to The Fix with Ryan Rothstein, live from the Prop Swap Studios of AM1490 Sports Betting Radio. Prop Swap that ticket and cash in while the odds have improved. Once again, here's Ryan. All right, welcome back to The Fix, 1030. So you know what that means. Time for our NFL Eagles insider. John McMullen. Follow John on Twitter at JF McMullen. Phillyvoice.com. SI.com is where you can find all of John's written work. And he he is the host of Extending the Play every Saturday morning right here on AM 1490, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. John, how are you tonight, sir? Doing well. How are you doing, Ryan? Doing well. Doing well. Um, Thursday night. I don't know uh, how much of this game you're watching. Uh, I am watching the game. I'm enjoying watching uh, Justin Herbert. Um, boy, he can sling it. He really can. Um, I, I said in the last segment, I was like, I said the same exact thing. I love watching Herbert. I think he's the real deal. He can sling the rock. But that head coach, man, he is just so bad. I, I don't understand how some of these guys get the head coaching jobs that they get. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's a big job. It's a tough job. It's one of those things where you're under the microscope and no better place to talk about that than Philadelphia where you win a Super Bowl and less than three years later, a lot of people, not all people, but a lot of people want to move on from Doug Peterson. So um, it isn't easy to win in this league. And, and you see it, I mean, Chargers are a perfect example. They they had that three game stretch where they just had big leads and um, they set an NFL record. Just lost every single game. They had seventeen point lead, seventeen point lead, and I think maybe twenty one. I don't know, something like that. Outrageous, and, and just kept giving them up. Um, yeah, I mean it, it's so many of these games are one score games, and they turn from genius to you know what pretty quickly in this league <laughs> yeah I mean uh, drop of a hat whatever you, whatever phrase you want to use um, it, it changes quickly you can be a genius one day and a complete idiot the next but with Lynn at least it just seems like um, he's been up against it <laughs> the, uh, the entire season making some pretty questionable calls alright John so here we are, Thursday night, and tomorrow night we'll do the full preview between the Eagles and the Cardinals, um, get your score and prediction and everything like that. So tonight, I mean, first I guess you can update us on the injuries, if there's anything new, what has changed, if at all. Uh, a little positive news, uh, starting with uh, Darius Slay being limited. Uh, so... Doesn't mean he's passed through the concussion protocol, but it means he's uh, heading in, in a good direction. So there's at least a chance uh, that he'll be able to play uh, against Arizona, and that's key for uh, a number of reasons. Obviously, he's the best cornerback in general, but also the Eagles have so many issues from an injury standpoint overall at the position. Avante Maddox is not going to play. Uh, with a knee injury. Uh, obviously, Cravon LeBlanc is on injured reserve. Craig James is on injured reserve. So, you know, you're down to Kayvon Seymour, um, and you don't want to be, even though we got to talk to him today. Really good story, good kid. But, I mean, you also have to be realistic, and you're pretty deep down the depth chart if you're playing him. And uh, that's doesn't bode well when the other side has DeAndre Hopkins and Larry Fitzgerald and Christian Kirk and on and on and on. Uh, a lot of playmakers on Arizona side of the ball. So it's important uh, to get Slay out there. Malik Jackson seen in the same boat, limited, uh, trying to come back from a concussion. So we'll see if he can get through the protocol. And then some of those guys who were dealing with hamstring injuries. Rudy Ford, uh, who's their best special teams player, he was back for the first time uh, in a while, uh, a full go of practice, so it looks like he'll return. And then some of the other 
defensive backs that were injured last week, Mike, Michael Jaquette, Graylin Arnold, they're at least uh, practicing in a limited fashion trying to come back from hamstring injury. So the Eagles are depleted in the secondary, to say the least, and that could be a, a clear problem. It would be a clear problem regardless of who you play in the NFL, but what type of problem does it present as it relates to this matchup this uh, Sunday? You look at Kyler Murray, and he had a nice showing against the Giants, 244 yards, a, a passing touchdown, no picks, 47 yards on the ground. But the two games prior, he was just, you know, he was average, a uh, buck 70 in the air, a buck 73 in the air, no touchdowns in one game and a pick. And the other game, he did have three passing touchdowns, but. He came down to earth a little bit. So how dangerous can he really be, especially with the secondary banged up like it is? Well, he's really dangerous. I mean, he, he, when he took that step back, it had a lot to do with he injured his shoulder in that uh, Seattle game, if you remember. Uh, really hurt the AC joint in his shoulder. So he, he wasn't uh, 100%, and that's why you saw the kind of dip in production. Uh, if you look before that, uh, you, you sort of see the real thing. So the question is, how, how, how healthy is he? How much is he back? You know, you know the, the running part of it is going to be uh, obviously tough to deal with. But as he gets feeling better and better coming off that shoulder, um, obviously he becomes more of a threat on that side of it as well. And, look, I mean, Hopkins is arguably the best receiver in football. He's certainly in the conversation. So, uh, I mean, that alone is a really difficult player to deal with. And then even though Larry Fitzgerald isn't what he once was, there's uh, no doubt about it, first ballot Hall of Famer, uh, he can still hurt you. And he's been an Eagles killer over the years. Uh, and then, you know, I mentioned Kirk. People don't talk about him because of the big names, but he's turned into a pretty good receiver, and even Andy Isabella. I mean, every, everybody can hurt you, um, and, and it starts, obviously, with Kyle and Murray. So uh, they're pretty explosive offensively, or at least they can be, uh, when he's feeling good and, and when that dual threat is present. And I, I think it's kind of a, a dual thing. I, I, you know, the Eagles played a ton of zone uh, coverage against the Saints because they had to because of all the injuries in secondary. I think you're going to see the same thing uh, here against the Cardinals. They're, they're just going to have to play a lot of cover two, a lot of cover four. Uh, and that's that kind of helps in two ways also because – you also have to deal with the running impact of Murray, and the last thing you want to do is turn your back on him anyway. So maybe it's a good week to have to play zone, uh, and that's the silver lining to it. So talk about the Arizona Cardinals and their offensive line, because after you say all of that, first thought that comes to mind is <laughs> the Eagles' defensive line really has to be able to create some pressure just with a four-man rush. Yeah, and they usually do. I mean, it, the defensive line has been the one aspect of this team that you could say, okay, they've been doing their job. I mean, Eagles are second in the league in sacks to Pittsburgh. They're first in the league uh, sacks from defensive linemen. Uh, so they've been doing it, and, and it's not only Brandon Graham and Fletcher Cox, but, you know, all of a sudden Josh Sweat is coming on. Uh, Javon Hargrave's coming on. Derek Barnett's been solid, even though people expected probably a little bit more. Uh, still a good player. Benny Curry, Curry can still get to the quarterback. So they can come at you in waves, uh, and, and that's the way Jim likes to, to do it. And that's, that's the one thing that's worked and the one thing that's been pretty consistent. This week, though, I, I you know, D.J. Humphreys is, is probably the best uh, offensive line than the Cardinals have. He's one of the best left tackles in, in the NFL. Um, I, I, and, and the right tackle's okay. 
Uh, the interior, though, is is a bit of an issue. So this has got to be a, a a Fletcher Cox, Javon Hargrave week, and hopefully Malik Jackson can get back from that concussion to help as well. But I think it's going to be up to those guys inside uh, to do it this week. And on the flip side, uh, you and I have talked a lot about Miles Sanders, especially this week after the game that he had Sunday, and he's been on the record talking about how happy he is to have Jalen Hurts in the <laughs> I gotta, huddle. <laughs> i got to tell you, Ryan, I have never seen Miles Sanders so happy. I he, know. He talked to us today. Again. He is giddy. <laughs> it's like he has uh, a high school crush. I mean, he, you know, he's typically a, a really understated guy. He's never kind of even keeled, and I don't, I don't know. He just must really like Jalen Hurts on, on a personal level. Uh, but he is really happy uh, about this change, and he can't hide it. He's the one guy who can't even hide it. No, he can't. And, and he said something, and I commented on it, and he, he talked about Jalen Hurts' poise in the huddle. And, listen, he, he could just have poise, and he's observing that, making an observation. That's fine. Um, but it just feels like he's he's saying it with a – Man, this is new. This is nice. Like, like he has a different. Jalen Hurts' confidence is impacting others. I guess is what I took from it. He has a coffee bean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what Jalen Hurts said. He's trying to be a coffee bean. Mm-hmm. Evidently, there's this whole uh, swing through uh, motivational speaker through college programs that tells everybody to be a coffee bean, and, and Jalen Hurts is. Uh, kind of latched on to that and, and basically that means uh, uh, make everyone around you better um, and uh, he he did that in, in week one. Now it's only week one and we'll see. I mean that's the thing about the NFL is you know people are going to adjust and now Arizona has film on Jalen Hurts at, at the professional level and they know what the Eagles like to do with him. So they're they're going to game plan with that in mind, and and we'll see if it can continue. Uh, and if it does, then then you probably really start to think you might have something. But yeah, I mean there are certain guys, and Miles is the leader of that club, as I said, that just seem very happy. Jalen Rager's in that club as well. Uh, that the Eagles made the change, and and. It could just come down to, you know, a personal relationship. Um, but for whatever reason, certainly Miles was effective. Now, you could say it's over 100 yards. Now, 82 was on one play. So it was sort of the home run and, and, and not much else. But he was also, and he mentioned today, you know, he admitted he's having a really bad season uh, as catching the football out of the backfield. But he, he was good uh, against uh, New Orleans. Um, and maybe it's that spark he needed. So we keep using that word. That's the word Doug uh, Doug keeps using. It's giving people a spark. And some people are leaders and natural leaders, and maybe Jalen Hurts is one of those guys. You mentioned Doug, and I just want to ask you about – how he's going to be able to transition with Jalen Hurts because, listen, it's only one game, the win over the Saints, but it seems like to me, especially in the short term, the best way to go about calling plays and game planning and figuring out an identity with Jalen Hurts as the starter is like the Ravens offense, like have that two-headed monster, one of them being the quarterback, with the rushing attack. And, And Doug doesn't seem like... That is his preference. So is he going to be able to consistently scheme and come up with um, game plans in that type of um, like avenue, in that type of direction? Yeah, I, I don't think that's going to be a problem. I, I mean, Jeff Stoutland's the run game coordinator. So, you know, he's the guy sort of responsible uh, to put together uh, that part of the game plan. Uh, and, and, you know, you saw it. Uh, they were tremendous uh, with the quarterback runs. It, it, you know, 
putting plays in is the easy part. Uh, teaching and and teaching the players to execute them is the difficult part. Um, and I, it's too early to deem it a success, as I said. But uh, and, and we'll see that that has more to do, in my estimation, with Arizona and how they adjust to what they see on film. But you saw a, a few of uh, Oklahoma plays that, that Jalen Hurts ran with the Sooners. Uh, and, and that's sort of what I always say, you know, when people talk about game. Anybody can look at the film. The Eagles looked at the Oklahoma film, and they put some runs in that, that Jalen had a lot of success on. Um, it, it, it's, it's, that part of it's not that difficult. Uh, the part that's difficult, again, is to, to make sure everybody's on the same page and executing uh, and doing everything they need to, need to do on a particular play. What, what I, I will say, it's pretty evident that Doug Peterson is better with quarterbacks that like to be told what to do. Uh, I think it's fair to say that at this point. Yeah, I mean, that seems uh, clear as day, but and I don't want to get us down a rabbit hole with this response, but it's like I know Carson Wentz isn't that guy, and I know he has the gunslinger Brett Favre style, but it doesn't seem like Carson Wentz is a guy that just w- doesn't listen. And I know he's not like a yes man, so I, I get that, but... I don't know how I'm trying to explain it. It's not coming out properly, but he just seems like a guy where, okay, coach, what are we doing? What do you see? And he's going to be on the same page and try and execute that. I don't know how you feel about it. Well, now, I mean, everybody's called him stubborn. He admits he's stubborn. He said he's stubborn. Yeah. So it's not like I'm breaking any news there. I mean, Frank no, Wright said it, John D. Filippo said it, Mike Gross said it, Doug Peterson said it, Carson Wentz just said it. Yeah. So he is stubborn, uh, and and it's uh, a self. Now sometimes that's good. Um, sometimes it's bad. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, he's not playing well, so it looks bad. When he was playing well, nobody cared. So it, it's not. I, I'm not pointing to that trait as. Um, necessarily a negative trait. In fact, it just about every great quarterback there is, at least veteran quarterback, uh, is is stubborn. Tom Brady is stubborn as you know what. Mm-hmm. I mean, beyond stubborn. Peyton Manning, uh, awful. Uh, you know, he basically ran the offense from the line of scrimmage. But those guys, like, uh, earned it. And just to, like, chime in, it's like – and I know this is nothing new. We've talked about this for years. Like, like, I'm aware that Carson Wentz has been on the record saying it and coaches have said it. But it just – he seems like the guy, just based off his personality, that, okay, I'm struggling. I stink. <laughs> like, Coach, what are we doing here? Let's get me right. At, at, like, at some point, you have to be a little bit self-aware and say, I'm I'm not that dude from 2017. Well, I agree with that, but I, I don't necessarily think that's the way uh, Carson looks at it. I, I mean, you know, he, he, he claims um, he's still confident, um, even though it doesn't seem like he's confident on the field, but I mean, he has reached this level. He has had tremendous success. Generally, athletes are very confident uh, in their abilities. And, you know, they think they're going to turn it around. Um, And and I just think his natural DNA, I think every player has a DNA. And his DNA is built on that, you know, stubbornness. It's built on wanting autonomy. It's built on wanting more and more and more, whereas other quarterbacks, and and Nick Foles is a perfect example of this, Nick craved, you know, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And everybody's different. And I'm I'm just taking it from a coaching standpoint. It just seems like Doug excels uh, with one read quarterbacks who just kind of, do what they're told, and if it's not there, okay, that's it. We'll go on to the next play. Who will?
will benefit the most, and Miles Sanders seems to be like the popular pick at the moment, who's going to benefit the most from Jalen Hurts and who's going to suffer? Carson Wentz and Zach Ertz had that relationship on the field and, and off it, but the production from Ertz and Carson's favorite target. So does the tight end position suffer or uh, a wide receiver in particular? Who's going to benefit and who's going to suffer from this? Well, yeah, I, I think the running backs are going to benefit. Uh, so Miles, most notably, but also Boston Scott. Uh, and the receivers are, are generally not going to benefit, although, I mean, they weren't putting up great numbers with Carson Wentz. But at least you had that opportunity for sort of a Pittsburgh game where they kind of exploded a little bit offensively. I don't think Jalen Hurts is that guy at this point. I, I mean, the hundred, I think, sixty-seven yards against the Saints, throwing the football. I, I don't think you're going to see three hundred yard passing days. So, I, I don't necessarily think you're going to see big numbers from the receivers. But you know, the first thing everybody's going to say, well, they were putting up big numbers anyway, except for the one sort of four-game stretch of Travis Fulgham. That's a, that's about it. So, I, I mean, the offense was so bad, it's tough for anyone to suffer dramatically. John, what uh, type of day does the offense have to have? We're going to talk more about predictions and specifics tomorrow night on the Friday show, on the Friday segment. Mm-hmm. But just to tease it even a little bit, like – what does Jalen Hurts have to do? Because we, we discussed the secondary and how dangerous the Cardinals' offense could be. So how are the Eagles going to potentially try and match that? Can they? Well, I, I do think, you know, he gave them the juice. He gave them a little spark, as Doug said. So I, I do think, in theory, they can match it. I, I uh, One thing, he's got to play clean again. Uh, he had to fumble late. Uh, he had the near pick six that was dropped. Uh, so there were opportunities uh, for New Orleans to turn them over. Um, you know, you got to be concerned with that Arizona secondary because, you, you, you know, you not only have Patrick Peterson, but uh, Buda Baker. I, I mean, they're big play guys. They're not just good players. They're guys who will – uh, make big plays, turn the football over, intercept it, sack, fumble, whatever. Uh, and, and that's my concern because, let's be honest, I mean, you have a young quarterback, and young quarterbacks are prone to make mistakes anyway. Uh, and then you see playmakers on the other side, and that would be my biggest concern. Now, you know, Arizona is an interesting defense because ever since they last lost, Chandler Jones, who obviously is one of the best pass rushers in football. They at, at one point they were playing no defensive linemen. They played six linebackers and five uh, defensive backs at times. And now they they've shifted back, but they, my point is they they'll do some weird things, and that you don't see other teams doing. And that's another thing with a young quarterback. Is he going to get frazzled by these weird things? So that's uh, I, I think that that's got to be a concern as well. Talking with NFL Eagles insider John McMullen, host of Extending the Play every Saturday on AM 1490, 10 a.m. to 11. Phillyvoice.com and SI.com is where you can find all of John's written work. John, did you see a tweet from Field Yates earlier today? This is completely off topic, um, but just salt in the wound for draft decisions from the Eagles and Jalen Rager. Uh, 49ers wide receiver Brandon Ayuk in his last five games and his stats. Well, I know Brandon's been playing well. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, look, there, it, it doesn't look good right now. Uh, but it's not over. You know, I always point to Brandon Graham. You know, it took Brandon basically three or four years, uh, really 
four years to come into his own. And ever since then, he's been a top ten edge player in this league for six, seven years. Um, so, I, I mean, yeah, Justin Jefferson is looks like a star. Uh, Brandon Ayuk looks like a star. Um, and you can go back to last season and DK Metcalf versus J.J. Ortega-Whiteside and on and on, Terry McLaurin. Uh, Eagles have made some bad decisions uh, in the draft, but I, I, I will point out that everybody makes bad decisions. If you look at those teams, those individual teams, they've all made bad decisions in the draft. Uh, all you got to do is look at the, their drafts. Nobody is 100% with this thing. Uh, unfortunately, the Eagles have had some high-profile misses, but I, I don't think you kind of know, I mean, the Eagles aren't even playing J.J. Arcega Whiteside. You kind of know they've given up on him. I, you know, Jalen Rager starting. He's a big part of this offense. He's getting a little bit better each and every week. I, I don't think it's time to pull the plug on him other than to say, if yeah, look, you should have took Jefferson. We all know that by now. And even if you didn't take Jefferson and you wanted a specific type of player, you probably should have took Ayuk because he was, uh, you know, he was more plug and play than Rager. So it, it, it does look bad now, but there's still an opportunity to turn that around. With the 53rd pick in the 2020 NFL draft, maybe they can turn it around a little bit. <laughs> Uh, in the short term. Oh, man. Yeah, uh, well, go ahead, John, I, I final mean, words. I, I've always said that Jalen Hurts' pick is a bad pick, and it has nothing to do with the player. I've said that yep. numerous times. And, you know, it, we're, we're at that point. I, I've been pretty consistent. Look, you were inviting controversy. Now you see the controversy. And... By definition, for Jalen Hurts to be successful in Philadelphia, Carson Wentz would have to fail, and that's what you're saying. So either way, to me, it it, it looks bad. Yeah, it's a no win. It's a no win situation, and that's where the Eagles find themselves right now. And the off season's only going to get more muddy, and um, but plenty to talk about for us. So, John McMullen for his nightly appearance right here on The Fix every night at 10.30. Follow John on Twitter at J.F. McMullen. John will do it again tomorrow night with a full preview between the Eagles and the Cardinals. It's going to be interesting. We'll have it covered for you right here on The Fix tomorrow night at 10.30. All right, John, go catch the end of this game, 24-24 between the Raiders and the Chargers. And Marcus Mariota, lighten it up. It's like Chip Kelly's dream, Marcus Mariota to Nelson Aguilar. Oh, man, he's he's somewhere smiling. <laughs> All right, thanks, John. <laughs> yep, thanks, John. Appreciate it, man. There he is, Johnny Mac. Great stuff. SI.com, phillyvoice.com, JF McMullen on Twitter. Um, I wanted to ask John about some Sixer stuff with the news breaking today, but we ran out of time. All right, we got to get to a break one hour down just like that. 